So today we're going to have a look at contingency tables. Contingency tables are a really useful way of summarizing the data for a study that we might have run. Sometimes for an individual we might record more than one categorical variable. For example, we might record their hair color and eye color. If the study has a large amount of people taking part, then we're going to be left with a really long list of data that we can't tell anything from. So if we put the data into a contingency table, it's a lot easier to see what's going on. So I think working through an example would help explain the concept a bit better. So here we have the contingency table for a study that was carried out on a number of students, and we recorded smoking status and gender for each of them. And these are just our two categorical variables. Now just to explain what's going on in our table, we can see that in the bottom right hand corner we have the total number of students surveyed. If we move into the centre we can see that 72 students surveyed were male smokers, 44 were male and non-smoker, 34 were female smokers and 53 were female non-smokers. 106 of the total number surveyed were smokers, 97 were non-smokers, 116 were male and 87 were female. Along the top we have our two options for our first categorical variable and these are smoker and non-smoker and then along the side we have the two options for our second categorical variable which are just male and female. So the table we have here is called a frequency table because it records the count values for our study but it's always a good idea to make the data as simple as possible so that when you look at it you can tell straight away what's going on. A good way of doing this is to rewrite your frequency table but instead of having your counts in each cell we generate the corresponding percentage values. And the table this gives is called a relative frequency contingency table. So to get the percentage value of a particular cell we divide the count value for that cell by the total number of students surveyed and multiply that by 100. So for our first cell we divide 72, which is our count value for cell 1, by 203, which is the total number of students surveyed, and we get 35.47%. The calculations for the other three cells are exactly the same, and I have the calculations here just so you can see where I'm getting the values from. Just to have a quick look back at our contingency table, the percentage value for the first cell is found by dividing 72 by 203, multiplying by 100, and we get our percentage value. When we've done this for each cell, we put our new percentage values into a table, and we have our relative frequency contingency table. So here in the bottom right-hand corner, we have 100% instead of 203, which just represents the total number of people surveyed. In the centre we can see that 35.47% of people surveyed were male smokers, 21.67% were male non-smokers, 16.75% were female smokers, and 26.11% were female non-smokers. So now that we've generated our relative frequency contingency table, we could be asked to find the joint distribution. So just as we have here, the joint distribution of our two variables is the corresponding percentage in terms of our two recorded categorical variables, gender and smoking status. All that means is that we need to find the percentages corresponding to each combination of our two categorical variables. So in our case, they'll be male smoker, male non-smoker, female smoker and female non-smoker, and these are pretty easy to find. All we have to do is go back to our relative frequency contingency table and look at the four center values and this is our joint distribution. If we add these four values together we should get 100% because these are the only categories that a person from our study can be classified into. So now that we have our joint distribution we could be asked to find the marginal distributions from this. So if we have found the joint distribution of our categorical variables and we're asked to find from this the individual distributions of each categorical variable, then these distributions are called the marginal distributions. From our example, we've just found the joint distribution of gender and smoking status, and now we want to find the individual distributions of these. These are our marginal distributions, 
so we're looking for the marginal distribution of gender and the marginal distribution of smoking status. A way of remembering is if we have the joint distribution and we're going from that to the single distributions of our variables, then we're looking for the marginal distribution. So to find the marginal distribution, we go back to our relative frequency contingency table. The marginal distributions are found in the outer margins of the relative frequency contingency tables, which is another good way of remembering how to find them. So if we look to the last column of our table, we can see that 57.14% of the students were male and 42.86% of the students were female, regardless of their smoking status. This is our marginal distribution of gender. On the bottom row, we can see that 52.22% of students we surveyed were smokers, while 47.78% were non-smokers, regardless of their gender. And this is the marginal distribution of smoking status. The last thing we might need to find is the conditional distribution. So the conditional distribution is the distribution of one event given that another has occurred. If we go back to our example and say we are interested in finding the distribution of smoking status for each level of gender. Because we are conditioning on gender, we are now dividing each value by its row total instead of the overall total. So all we do is divide 72 and 44 by 116 and 34 and 53 by 87 and then multiply each value by 100 to get the corresponding percentage. So I've just included the calculations here. So when we divide 72 and 44 by 116, we get 62.07% and 37.93% respectively. When we divide 34 and 53 by 87, multiplying both by 100, we get 39.08% and 60.92% respectively. We can pop these values back into a table just to make things a little simpler and we can see now that our row totals are 100%. This is because we have restricted gender. So each row gives us the conditional distribution of smoking status for each level of gender. Similarly, if we were interested in the conditional distribution for each level of smoking status, we divide each value by its column total because we're conditioning on smoking status. So again, I have the calculations included, and you can see we've divided 72 and 34 by 106, which is our column total, multiply by 100, and we get 67.92% and 32.08% respectively. Next, we divide 44 and 53 by 97, and multiply by 100 to get 45.36% and 54.64%. Putting these values into a table, we can see that our, both our column totals are 100% because this time we've restricted smoking status. Now each column gives us the conditional distribution of gender for each level of smoking status. The development of these resources was supported by the NDLR and the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at NUI Maynooth, and they will be available from the following websites.